They do such a good job. Try to, ah, right, so this will just work, right? Okay, good. I want to make sure. I just want to thank the, uh, all the people that have been serving. So thank you to Addison and to all the Smiths that have served for setting up for the party and cleaning up and all the fellowships that they do. Thank you for uh, the Smith boys and Jacore and for all that they do for helping and clean up and then set up and then tear down and uh, especially for their service yesterday um, when the entire youth group we had 100% participation for uh, visitation and door knocking soul winning yesterday and just it is a blessing to see all those that constantly are are serving and they're not weary in well doing and. That's a, I think that's very important that we need in our church. So I just want to make sure that I thank them for that. Thank you, Cash. Thank you, Jacore. Thank you, Tucker. Thank you, Laredo. Thank you, Miss Tammy, for all the work that you frequently do every week. Thank you to all of the uh, church members that you just show up and you're here. Um, just you being here makes a huge difference for our church. It gives a... Uh, uh, from a, a pastoral perspective and pers uh, position, it just it gives us a reason to be here, to preach from this pulpit. And so I don't want to take that lightly. I, I thank you for being here today. And I thank you to those who serve. Thank you to my wife and for little Selah for serving and what you can as well. If you will, please turn with me to Second Peter today. We're going to look at the Apostle Peter and his writings. And he doesn't write a lot. He's not like Paul. And we'll see that, um, if we get to it, we'll, we'll make mention of, he makes mention of Paul in his writing um, and <laughs> makes mention that some of the things that Paul writes are hard to understand. <laughs> and so Peter tries to just be himself and he writes plainly. He writes simply. He writes in a way that he just wants to be very practical and helpful to every single person that reads what he has written. So turn with me to 2 Peter, and let's look at chapter 2. And let's look at verses 1 through 3 of chapter 2. But we, we almost have to go back to chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, before we can read verses 1 through 3 of chapter 2. So look at chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. It says... Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Chapter 2. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they, with feigned words, make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. The word of God is powerful, and it does not use its language lightly. If there's a warning that Paul and that Peter, apostles of God, authorized messengers of God are giving, we should heed it and listen to it carefully. Before we begin any more, let's pray. Oh, Lord God, I love you, Father. And I need you today. I cannot preach this word in your will and in your way and with your power and with the way that you want it to be preached and with the message that you want to be communicated from it without you today. I need you, Lord God. Please hide me behind your cross. Take over. Please give me your words to speak. Please, please give me your thoughts to think as I preach. Please give me clarity and focus and concentration. And please 
Help me to preach your word and your way so that your people can have your food that you want them to take from today's service and message. Oh, Lord, they need you. Please help me to be able to just serve them the food that you've already made. And, oh, Lord, I pray, Father, that you please help me to be a help and a blessing today. Please bless this service. Help us to leave changed into your image, we pray now in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father, for it. Amen. Peter's instructing the church to beware of false teachers. Beware of false teachings. He warns believers to be on the lookout for those who bring in these false teachings. And he tells the church how to recognize a false teacher. He tells them in verses 20 and 21 of uh, chapter 2. So turn with me to the end of chapter 2 here. Look at verses 20 and 21. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But also look at, um, look at verses 3 here in chapter 2. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. And verse 2, and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. This, Peter's telling people what they can watch out for to recognize false teachers. And he's telling them also what's the end thereof. He's warning them that if you follow after the right way, follow after the teachers of God that truly have a right holy, humble spirit that want to teach the word of God. Here's a, a water for Miss Hazel if she needs one. There is we don't need a private teacher. We don't need a private instructor. We don't need somebody that says that, oh, the word of God is so hard to understand. You need me to tell it to you. You need me to explain it to you. You can't understand it on your own. That's not what the Bible says. The Scripture is of no private interpretation. No private person has the sole authority to tell you exactly what the Bible says, and nobody else can disagree with them. God's already done that. God is saying the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. It wasn't secret men in high institutions of authority and power that were going to find out the will of God and the word of God and bring it down to the people who could not hear it. God called the same prophets that he made holy men from both rich and poor, from both tall and small. He called pastors from shepherds, and he called pastors from priests, sons, and kings, and princes. He called prophets from people that had a stutter and didn't want to speak to those that were eloquent and flowing in their speech and could write long books of the Bible. But that's not he didn't just choose individuals, and those individuals didn't come to God and say, hey, here I am. I know I'm so great. Use me. Use me. I know you, you, you know you want me. It would be a great service to you. No. God couldn't use that. He used the humble, those that didn't think, those that recognized that they weren't of deserving nature for God to use them. Prophecy didn't come by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That Holy Spirit gave them the word to speak. They didn't speak by themselves. Jeremiah said, it's like a burning fire in my bones that I do not speak the word of God. I can't hold it in. It's in there and it's just coming out. It's flowing out. I need to preach the word of God. Earlier in chapter 1, Peter taught the church, these are things you know. Let's look at that. Chapter 1, we have to go all the way, let's, uh, well, let's look at verses 5 through 8 first. It says, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you, and abound, that not, they're just not just in you just a little bit, but 
there's so much in you that there's a fullness of each one that it flows out to other people. It's, he says, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what every single one of us need today. We need the abounding of these virtues, of these areas of growth in the Christian life so that we can abound, so that we can give of these things to other people. And they, it says, will, you, will help us be fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ because of them. So let's look at, look at that a little bit, but backtrack a little bit more to verse 2. Where does this come from? Where do these things come from? Verse 2, Peter tells us, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. This comes from God. It only comes from God. We can only get these virtues, these areas of great precious promises from God, and we need them to be able to have a fruitful Christian life throughout all of our life. When these areas are developed in a Christian's life to maturity, in a, they abound. Peter says their life will be neither barren nor unfruitful, and that we will be a great servant of God because of them. But if these areas remain undeveloped in a Christian's life, if a person gets saved but they don't grow in these areas, their life will remain unfruitful. There's a great lack of discernment and awareness there. It says that if we look at the next couple verses at verse 9, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Sadly, there's a verse that comes to mind in Proverbs of a dog that returns to his own vomit that Peter uses, I believe. And uh, I don't see it right away, but there's, it's just like, it's like if you could imagine a toddler, somebody that has grown to just old enough that they can see of the things in this world, but their attention is distracted by everything that's really close to them. And they're surrounded by noises and flashing lights and toy, toys and those little spinner things that say the animals' voices and noises and things. And they wander around. They go from right beside, nearer to, to each one, and they go to a closer one, or they do, go to the next one that catches their attention, but they're never moving past those things that are just surrounding them. They're never moving past the distractions to follow after the greater things that may be further off that they would have to see further down to be able to follow after them. And God is saying, don't follow after just these things that are close around you that are distracting you. Don't go back to the things that were in your life before you got saved. Look at what I want you to follow after and follow after me. They can't see in the distance if they don't have these areas developed in the Christian's life. They're too concentrated on just trying to see what's right in front of them. But Peter encourages to belie believers to grow in these areas, to make their calling and their election sure. And so, in verse 10, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What's Peter saying here? Peter's saying that if they have not given over their life to Jesus Christ, he's saying, make sure of your calling and your election. He's saying, make sure of your salvation. Make sure of your relationship with Jesus Christ because you don't want to be like those that have not developed these areas. You don't want to be like a person that is blind and cannot see afar off. You want to have these areas developed in your life. But those that have not made sure of their faith, they've, they haven't made sure that they have that relationship in Jesus Christ who he has shed his blood for their sin, that his blood was applied to their sin debt, that his blood was covering their account, 
that they had called on Jesus Christ to save them, that they had believed that Jesus had risen the third day from the grave and was with God the Father because he's, he is God and he came from God and he returned to God. Peter's saying, make sure you have this relationship in the first place. If you're not sure about it, get sure about it. He diligent reminds them of all these things, all these basics and the, these foundational important areas in Christianity because he wants people to grow. He doesn't want them to just remain the same. He wants them to be able to grow to maturity, to be able to go to others who have not grown and share what they have learned with them. And he's saying these things, and he's reminding them of them. And it says in verse 12, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. I won't be negligent to put you in remembrance of them. I know you know them. Remember them. I know you know them. Remember them. I know you know them. Remember them. And he says, it, yeah, I think it is meat in verse 13. As long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. As long as I'm alive, I'm going to keep reminding you because it's that important. And I imagine that Peter needed to le learn this lesson when he was with the Savior for those three years. That God had to be patient with him as he had such a hard head and a thick skull that he just kept learning the same lessons over and over and over until he finally got it. And now that he's finally gotten it, He's diligent to be able to go over the same lessons over and over and over again with other people so that they can get it too, and they won't forget it. So why do we need to be reminded of these areas of growth? Why do we need to be reminded of the basics of Christianity that we need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ? And then we need to grow into these areas of diligence, of faith, of virtue, of knowledge, and temperance, and patience, and godliness, and brotherly kindness, and charity, why do we need to grow in these areas? Because there were false teachers in the Old Testament that were drawing people away from these things, and there are false teachers in the, uh, they were, that were in the New Testament that were drawing believers away from these things, and there's false teachers today who are drawing people away from these things. So bottom line up front, watch out for any person who denies the Lord Jesus Christ or God's word. Micah prophesied with the word of the Lord against such evildoers in his time. And so turn with me to Micah chapter 2. And these are the two books we're going to be in today. 1 Peter, or 2 Peter chapter 2 mostly, and Micah chapter 2 and 3 mostly. So turn with me to Micah. It's Hosea, Joel, or uh, let's see, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. So right after Jonah. Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Micah chapter, we'll look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, to start with, and it says, Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is late, they practice it, because it is in the power of their hand, and they covet fields and take them by violence, and houses, and take them away. So they oppress a man in his house, even a man and his heritage." Micah preached during the time of uh, King Ahaz and King Hezekiah, and he preached some messages to the north kingdom of Israel and the south kingdom of Judah, specifically to the cities sometimes of Samaria and the cities of Jerusalem, the capitals of north Israel and the capital of south Judah when the kingdom was split. And he was prophesying that because of sin, if you do not repent, judgment is coming. And that judgment will be taking away the people out of the land. For the north kingdom, it would be eventually Assyria would take the people out of the land. For the south kingdom and for Judah and Jerusalem, eventually Babylon would come and take their people out of their land. But here he's say, saying that during his time, there were evildoers who were doing wrong and they weren't repenting of it. It says they were evil while, even while they were on their beds. They're laying down either at night or in the morning and the very last thing they think at night or the very first thing they think in the morning is that how can I steal from people today? How can I get for me from others? And it's evil. Woe to them that despise iniquity, that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. 
Well, in Peter's time, he was warning the believers about this very same thing. If we look at 2 Peter chapter 2, and you really need to put a piece of paper in here so I can flip back and forth more easily. He's warning about those that would make merchandise of them. And it says in verse 3, Through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not. Micah prophesied of judgment for those evildoers in his day. What did he say? That if, oh, that thou, let's see. These evildoers would imagine evil to do if they would have just heard the Lord's word. It would have been to them for good to repent and to grow. Let's look at that. In verse 7 of Micah chapter 2, it says, Oh, that thou that art named the house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord straightened? Is the Lord not powerful enough to speak unto you? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly? And so to those evildoers, to the people of Jerusalem, and to the people of Samaria even, to all the people of Israel, if you would just listen, it would be to you for good from the word of God. But they didn't want to hear from God. They didn't want to fix their broken and evil ways. They didn't want to imagine good from the morning or from the evening when they were laying upon their bed. They only wanted sweet, false words of encouragement. They wanted God to just be with them no matter what, no matter what they did. But God, in his righteousness, in his criticism and judgment of evil, says concerning them in verse 11, if a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink, he shall even be the prophet of this people. Meaning, this people doesn't want to hear anything that I actually have to say. If a prophet would be of this people, a false prophet, He'd be the prophet that says, yeah, go get drunk. Yeah, go ahead, do whatever you want to do. That's the word of the Lord. That false prophet. And God is criticizing them on, on, of this. And he's saying that their spirit is wrong. Their repentance is nowhere. They don't have the heart to actually hear the word of God. And some will outright deny Jesus Christ in our day. They don't want to hear the word. God, they've already got decided in their hearts what it is. Uh, I think of the Jehovah's Witnesses. That de they deny that Jesus Christ is Jehovah God. And they deny that he is the eternal, self-existent I am, the same God that saved the people from Exodus and saved Israel and brought them into the land. They deny that Jesus is that same God. They deny that he's the God who's the same from Genesis to Revelation. So watch out for those who deny Jesus Christ that he is God. Some will claim the name of God and the name of Jesus Christ, but will bring in false doctrines and evil teachings. And the Bible calls them in 2 Peter pernicious ways, meaning evil ways. And so they'll claim the name of God. They'll claim the name of Jesus. They'll come in. They might even have a different denomination's church name on their building or on their title of pastor but they'll bring in these evil ways. I think of Calvinism. This idea that God only chooses some to save, but he chooses who to send to hell. That's an evil teaching. That will result in many not being saved just because of man's philosophy about the word of God. And I don't mean to, I don't mean, mean any of this in an evil way or to pick on people or to put anybody down. But I want to criticize the teachings because they're not of God. Not the people. Love the people. These people need God. They are a soul that is infinitely valuable because God has created them, and they need Jesus just the same as we do. But there are teachings like the LGBTQ teachings, or witchcraft, or sorcery, demonism, and devil, manipulation, and dominance pride, lying, and backbiting. Claiming God and Jesus sometimes even while teaching these evil lessons and even evil examples. And there are people that will claim the name of God and claim the name of Jesus, but they'll bring these teachings into their church. They'll bring occultism into their church, or they'll bring supernatural kind of belief systems into their church. They'll bring an LGBTQ agenda and 
ideology into their church. They'll bring critical race theory into their church and saying that some people are worth more than others. That's not of God. Or if they believe that a man can marry a man or a woman can marry a woman or a man can be whoever, whatever sex he wants to be or a woman can be whatever sex that she wants to be, that's, that's not of God. God has created each one infinitely valuable and he never made a mistake. They are exactly who they are to be when God has made them. But there's a consequence to these teachings. Christianity, God, are evil spoken of because of these evil examples. Because man has brought in lies. Because man has brought in evil. Because man has brought in wrong into the church and done wrong and abused people because of their filthy, wrong, false, lying, evil ideologies. And they hurt people. And they hurt children. I couldn't bear it if somebody hurt my daughter in a church. But there are those who have done that. So watch out for people who will claim the name of God, but then will say that these are the ways of God. Watch out for teachers who claim Christ in faith, but walk after the lusts of this world. Micah preached against the merchant, making merchandise of the people. Paul, uh, Peter's preaching against making the merchandise of the people. We can strengthen ourselves against this deception, though, by learning what these false teachers look like, what they sound like, and strengthening our knowledge in the word of God. So look at verse 12 again in 2 Peter, and it says I will, that he will not be negligent to put us in remembrance. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Now, I'm going to list a number of verses that's just an illustration of this. But our youth has been memorizing Bible verses because of this. Because it's so important for us to have the word of God not only in our hands, but in our heart. Because Psalm 101, I'm sorry, Psalm 119, verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. If it's in here instead of in here, if it's in here, no matter what somebody else is saying unto them, the word of God and the spirit of God will fight against any lies that are trying to be preached unto them. And that's what I want them to have. That's what you need too. That's what we all need. Psalm 119, 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It's the best way to actively resist and fight evil in our, in our lives from the inside out. Psalm 119, 172, my tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Psalm 100, verse 2, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave unto me. Psalm 139, verses 23 through 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. If you turn to Psalm 19, that's a great psalm, and I love that. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he hath set a tabernacle for the sun. And if we move down to the law of the Lord is perfect, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. How we hide the word of God in our hearts is how we can purify our hearts by the pouring in of the water of the word of God into our lives, just like a nice hot shower. It can cleanse us from the inside out instead of the outside in. And that's how we can purify our lives. When I was dealing with the problem of how do I go from a lifestyle that has been dishonoring and displeasing to God that I've lived for several years? How do I create a lifestyle, a mind, and a heart that is now pleasing unto him? And I realized that there was a, 
a dual purpose I needed to take into my life now. On the one hand, I needed to stop pouring in trash and junk. Just like if you would continuously pour oil into a pitcher, it's going to stay in there until you get it out. And if you keep pouring more in, it's not going to come out. But if you start pouring in some soap and water and you stop pouring in the oil and you continuously clean and clean and clean, it's going to take a while. But if you keep pouring in more soap and water and keep cleaning and stop pouring in the oil, eventually it will get clean. But I had to pour in the word of God into my life in a greater abundance than I was pouring in junk and eventually stop the junk altogether. This world is going to be filled with that junk that it's going to be hard to not get any in there. And we're going to walk through this world. God said to his own apostles that your feet are going to get dirty, and so I need to clean them for you. You don't need to be cleaned all over. You're already saved. At the Last Supper, he's talking to them about this. But your feet need to be cleaned because they're going to be dirty just walking in this world. And so we need that too. We need the constant refreshing, filling, and purifying of the word of God pouring into our lives is the best way to actively fight and resist the evil in our lives from the inside out. Psalm 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, for his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, for like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. But if we look at Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 7, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In verse 7, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Part of that's pride. We need to get rid of the pride that we have. We, we constantly need these reminders from Peter. And John 3.16 is the verse system that we've been learning in the youth group. Even if we don't have this, we can still give the gospel. We have a list of verses we can memorize and be able to give the gospel. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. You know he loved you. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody's done something wrong, haven't you, in your life? Romans 3.10, all, as is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's not a single person that can claim that I'm perfect in my ways and I deserve to go to heaven. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. You, didn't, you admitted that you've done something wrong. Do you know there's a cost for that? The cost of sin is death. But here's the good news. Jesus didn't leave it that way. For the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in Romans 5, 8, it tells us, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And, but if we just left it there, how do we apply that to us? Romans 10, 9 through 11 and 13 tell us, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, and with the heart uh, man believeth unto righteousness, for the scripture saith that whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a 100% promise and guarantee. But what, what, what if we're saved already? How do we know for sure that we can know that we're saved? 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And because we're hiding these things in our hearts and we don't have to go look them up. They're already in there. We can hold on to those great and precious promises that Peter was talking about that make a sure and firm foundation for our faith and for our soul, and we can launch off of that foundation to grow into these areas that he wants us to grow in. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5, please. Galatians chapter 5, because the list that I'm going to read from Peter sounds very similar to the list that Paul gave in Galatians 5 of the fruit of the Spirit. And we're going to compare that real quick before we close here. Galatians chapter 5, and it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, 
meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Then what did Peter say? He said, diligence, faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. These are, uh, these are very similar lists of areas that we need to grow in to be able to continuously abound in these fruits to be able to pour into other people's lives. Have you ever met a Christian that they're not developed in these areas? That it seems like almost every person that they get around, it's, there's just, you, you know there's something missing. You, you know they're not quite comfortable. You, you know that there's things in their life they're holding on to not the best that they should be holding on to. But have you ever been around a person that they're mature in these areas? They're growing in them. It's just the word of God just pours out of them. This, those fruits of the spirit just pour out of their spirit. You, it's almost like you're hungry for more of their attention and more of that spirit. My pastor Johnny Pope from Christ Church is such a man like that. I mean, he just gave you, the, when you were around him, it seemed like you were the 100% the thing that he was had his concentration and his attention on. He was paying attention to you. He was listening to you. But he had such wisdom at every problem or any problem you might have asked him about. And he wanted to help you. And he had the utmost desire of sincere care and love and desire for your growth in, in every area of life. You, it just, you felt it pouring out of him. And you knew he prayed for you. God loves us so much. And he wants us to be secure and foundationally strong in all of these areas. Lastly, let's look at one important reason of why we should be sure in these foundations in these areas. Turn me to you with me back to Second Peter and chapter two and verse nine. Second Peter chapter two verse nine says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. First Corinthians ten thirteen says that there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. And so with that verse from Corinthians, knowing we have a way of escape, we have a way to bear through the temptation because God has made a way of escape. And it's not just us that's going through this. The, the uh, temptations are common to all man. We can know that we can trust the Lord in all areas of life and in every situation that we're in. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. The second half of that, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. There are consequences for these evildoers for what they do. In Micah's day, this resulted in the destruction of Jerusalem the first time by Babylon, and the destruction of Samaria and Israel by the Assyrians, in Peter's day, Jerusalem was destroyed again in 70 AD by Rome. And it was prophesied of that by our Lord Jesus Christ himself. There were, the world will also face judgment at the second coming of Christ, where they will face him for their rejection of him and all the wrong that they have done. We Christians need to be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves because we need to recognize evil and we need to recognize good and choose the good over the evil and choose to do good at all times. And so the last thing I want you to imagine is just think of your children, your grandchildren, your, those that are of innocence in your lives, growing up in a world that it's worse than you grew up in. And it is. But imagine their children down the road and what the world will be when they're growing up in it. Now, God is faithful, and he will and knows how to deliver his children out of temptations. We've just read that. But this world is not getting better. It is getting worse and worse. And so we need to be able to prepare our children, our grandchildren, those that are around us, so they can recognize the evil 
for what it is and recognize the good and choose it. Sela is going to take after me. We already recognize she's strong-willed. She's a fighter. <laughs> I think she needs that. She's going to face a world that I was hadn't even imagined that she would face. I want her so much to be ready for it. I don't pray for easy ways for her in this world. I do pray for her protection every single day, but I don't pray for easy ways because every difficulty, every situation is an opportunity for her to earn the favor of her Lord once she gets saved. Every difficulty and challenge that she faces, I know God will be there because he's promised to to give her exactly what she needs for that situation. But it will be up to her, left hand, right hand, what will she choose? Today, you will have opportunities. Tomorrow, the rest of this week, it'll be easy maybe to remember this tomorrow, but by Wednesday, by Thursday, by Friday, will you remember when you are given a choice between the easy but maybe the evil way? and the really hard, difficult, but right way of God, what will you choose? What will you choose? I'll leave that to you in God. Please stand to your feet if you're able.